thank you. Thank you all, all for joining in and singing and uh, being a part of this time of worship together. It has been wonderful to be here with you all here at Chunky this week. And I tell you, Gary, thank you for all the time and effort you've put together and gotten all these folks involved and, and, uh, and you all involved and singing praises to the Lord. And it's just been wonderful. And all the folks that provided food and stuff, uh, I, it was a joy for me to come over here and listen to these two guys eat. Uh, it was noisy, but I'm telling you, they, they, we all put it away. I'm telling you, it's been a great time, and y'all have been so such a blessing. It's not an easy time to have a revival, and you know that, and, and school starting back and all kind of things pulling and pushing at you. But you folks have just done a magnificent job this week, and I am thankful to you for the folks that you've encouraged to be here, and you being here has just been a blessing beyond description, I'm telling you. So thank you all so much for allowing me to be here. Uh, the last time I was here was for the 125th anniversary, and uh, I had been here one time before that, 55 years before that, and... Uh, and it had been 55 years before they invited me back. And, uh, and I got invited back this time just about a year later. So I'm telling you, I'm doing good. But if y'all wait 55 more years, uh, I may not make it. I'm just going to tell you. But I have been blessed to be here with y'all this week. And we'll never forget it. The year of 2020 and all the things we've dealt with. And amazing how the world has just changed. Every, the whole world has changed over this past six, eight months, and uh, I don't know what the future holds, but I do know who holds the future, and you and I can serve him regardless of what's going on in our world. Now tonight on this last message, and I, I struggle with coming to a last message and a revival because I usually have about five messages that I want to preach, and uh, I guess I could preach all five of them tonight if y'all will stay awake, and uh, and all God's people said, oh, no. <laughs> I know the answer there. But I want to share with you a message. But uh, I, want, want to, I want you to think about this with me for a minute. If, you were, if I was your pastor or if your pastor asked you, I, I'm going to preach a series of messages on uh, the greatest chapters in the Bible. There are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. And whenever you think about that, what are the greatest chapters in the Bible? And if you were to think, just think of one, and uh, I'd just like to know. You, you can uh, help me to narrow it down from about 50 of those to about 20 of those or maybe 10 messages that I would preach on the greatest chapters in the Bible. What would you want to hear a message on? on one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. Just think about it for a moment, and what would you include in that series of messages? This is the participatory time of the meeting, and, uh, and if you have a, if you have, it's no wrong answer, so what would you say would be one of the great chapters of the Bible? Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And whenever you start reading that, Man, Romans chapter 8, you could not leave that out. And I, I, would, I would include that in my uh, 20. John chapter, four. John chapter 4. One of the great chapters in John and one of the great chapters in the Bible. And when you start reading that whole thing and you begin to think, good gracious, what John chapter 4, I can do that. Anybody else? Which is that is exactly, and that with you and Gary, I'm going to preach on Romans eight tonight. So uh, that is exactly. Any other chapter that you would include? Galatians chapter three. We got too many coming at us now. What? Galatians Who said that? <laughs> All right, Galatians chapter three. That, I'm telling you, you folks have read some of the Bible. I, I probably wouldn't preach on that one, but I would tell you that's one of the great chapters of the Bible. And you had 
Genesis chapter 1. You could not leave out Genesis chapter 1. And, and when I say that, it is the seed bed for everything else that's going to take place in the entire Bible. You can find the doctrines of the Scripture in the book of Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and the things that grow out, and it goes on to the book of Revelation. All right, one other chapter. The 23rd Psalm. How could you leave out the 23rd Psalm? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. You could not leave out Psalm 23. Anybody else got one? I'm waiting on you to call the one that I'm going to preach on is what I'm waiting on. What? John chapter 3, how could you leave that out? The great chapter on the new birth in Christ Jesus. Now, I'd, I'd preach on that too, and I did the other night. Anybody else got one? You're not thinking hard enough. I don't know what you would do, Genesis chapter 22. And when I, Abraham took Isaac up to offer him, and, and the beautiful picture of the cross that's there right in the book of uh, Genesis in the opening pages of the Bible. I don't know where you'd start uh, culling out what you're not going to do. But tonight I want to ask you to open your Bible to what is the greatest chapter in the Bible, not the greatest chapter in the Bible, but the greatest chapter in the Bible on the resurrection. There is no place in the Bible that says as much about the resurrection, your resurrection, and Jesus' resurrection than in the book of... I'm waiting on y'all to say... In the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. And in chapter 15, I want you to, I'm not going to preach on the whole chapter because there are 58 verses in that chapter. But I want to read, I want to just think about it is the greatest chapter on everlasting life and the resurrection that is going to be ours in Christ Jesus. And you, you, it's amazing to stop and think about all that Paul said. He said, I declared unto you the gospel how that Jesus died according to the scriptures and that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scripture and he puts right there in a nut form the very gospel that we preach every time we preach. But then he goes on and says that Jesus is the first fruits of those who are going to be raised. The very first person to ever die and then be raised to live forevermore was Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And then he goes on and talks to us about the resurrection. Now, I know all that's in the future for us. I know that's down the road. And he says, this mortal shall put on immortality, and this corruptible shall put on incorruption. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is said, death is swallowed up in victory, and you and I are going to live forever. Now, I wish that I had time, and it would take about uh, several nights, just to look at the chapter on the resurrection and you and I could see what we're going to have. And we, we see death with such morbid eyes. And the truth is that we're going to live and we're going to live forever and he tells us how that's going to be taking place and God has made that for you. What is so interesting to me about this chapter is that the last verse is like it was written in a different world at a different time, and a different thought. Because the last verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that verse doesn't say anything about the resurrection. And that verse, and I'll tell you why I think it's so different. Let me just read it for you in verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, whenever you read that last verse, it's like he's talking about a different thing altogether. It's not about the resurrection. He said, but all that's going to come. But you know what I think? I think the Spirit of God said to Paul, Paul, there are going to be some people who are going to read this chapter and... and uh, the sweet by and by is not what they're worried about. They're worried about the bad now and now and not so much about the sweet by and by. 
And so he comes to the last verse, and he says to the folks at Chunky, and he says to me, and he says to you, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I have never in the 57 years I've been preaching seen as many discouraged Christians as right now. They walk around in weirdness and they walk around wondering what in the world is going to happen and they walk around like their lives are controlled by that virus. And the fact is that a lot more people are dying every week in America from heart disease than they are from the virus. And there are more people dying from cancer than they are from the virus. And yet we've focused on that so much to think that we can't do anything because there's a virus loose among us. Jesus is still on his throne. And I know that these are difficult days, but I want you to know, Chunky Baptist Church, Jim Futrell, I want you to know that you can go on serving the Lord with victory. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Come go with me for just a few minutes. I want you to go with me. I was uh, going up to a man. He had asked me to come by his business. Uh, he had built a new business. There's a new building and all. And he had stayed after me, and he wanted me to just come by there and see him. I've known him for years, and I told him I was going to come by there. So one day on the way home, I, I, I just went to the, I knew where the building was and the new business that he had built. And so I, I pulled in there in the parking lot, and I got out of my car, and I was walking from my car into the, into the business up there, and I was just taking it all in, looking at the beautiful, it was a beautiful building he had built for his business. And as I was walking along there, there was a bird. I'm talking about a great big bird. I mean, it looked like an, it looked like an eagle. It looked like it was huge, but, uh, and it was coming right toward me I saw the bird and this great big bird this huge bird I immediately thought he thinks this is a landing strip <laughs> and I thought here he's coming right at me and going to land on my head and probably break his neck you know here he's coming and I thought he was coming right down there going at me well he didn't come right to me what he did is he flew right over me and I saw him, and I watched him, and, and it wasn't an eagle, and it wasn't a buzzard. It was a great big red hawk. And we've got a lot of them in that area of North Jackson out there. And this great big red hawk was full wing spread coming toward me, and he went right over me, and he landed on top of that new building. You following me? And that new building had that new kind of roofing that looks like old tin roofing. It's probably fiberglass stuff, but it's, uh, it looks like old tin roof. And that's what they'd built this building out of. And he landed on top of that fiberglass or on that look, what looked like a tin roof. And when he landed on top of that roof, he was used to landing maybe on a house with, uh, you know, just regular shingles on it. But no, he landed up there on top of that uh, new slick roof and his mama hadn't told him about those kind of roofs. And when he hit that roof, you, I was standing there watching him and his great big old talons, he was grabbing for something and there wasn't anything to grab for. There wasn't anything that would hold him. And he hit that roof and he's sliding down that roof slowly backwards and I know that I knew what he was thinking. I read their minds, and uh, and I knew what he was thinking. He thought, "I'm thinking to die right here." <laughs> and he's sliding down that roof, and he's grabbing and snatching, and he can't get hold of anything. And all of a sudden, you know what he bumped into? A pipe, a vent pipe that came up through the roof, and he book, slid right into that vent pipe, and he stopped sudden shocking stop and I'm standing there watching him and I want to tell you that uh, I, I, want, I want to bring a message to you from this verse of scripture but I want to uh, let this bird talk to you for a minute 
because I, I would entitle the message to you from Paul and that bird, hang on, hang on. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Hang on. Now watch that bird as he bumped into that pipe. And what I want to preach about tonight is, uh, is only it happened in about a minute to 90 seconds. That's all it was. But it'll take me about 30 minutes to tell you about it. But I want you to just Think about hang on, because that's what that verse says. And when I tell you that, I know these are difficult days. And so many people are going through such difficult times when all these people, so many people are without work, and so many people are losing loved ones. And I'm not making fun of the virus because it is a terrible, terrible thing that has wrecked our world. But I'm here to tell you that God says, look to me in the midst of all of this. And whatever's going on in your life and whatever you're facing, to look to him and to realize that he still has a plan and a purpose for your life. Hang on. Sometimes I, I feel like, sometimes I feel like the, the little girl, preschool. She, she went to preschool, kindergarten at a church and and uh, one day her dad came by to pick her up, and this little old preschool girl, they saw the dad come in, and he was way down the hall, and he was walking down there to get his little girl and take her. And as he was walking along there, she broke loose from the group that she was with, and the teacher let her go. And that day they had, so, they had blown up some balloons with uh, helium, and the balloon was, you know, flying in the air. And she came along there, and it was on a string, and she was holding on to it, but it was hitting the top of the uh, the top of the uh, hallway there, and it hit something sharp, and when it did, pow! And it just floated down in a pile right there in front of her. Her dad walked up there, and her face is squinched up, and she's starting to cry. And she looked up at her daddy and she said, picked up that pile of latex and said, Daddy, fix it. And sometimes we get to the place in this old world that we just can't handle too much more and we want to say, Daddy, fix it. Some things you just can't reach down and put back together, but God can. I think about that uh, Air Force pilot who crashed his plane. I have felt this way before. He crashed his plane, and he had to write up. He lived through it, and he had to write up the crash and a report on the crash. And this is what he wrote. I want you to just listen to this guy this U.S. Air Force pilot. He said, after a catastrophic engine failure, failure, I landed long. I had no power. The landing gear failed to deploy. There was no braking available. I bounced over a stone wall at the end of the runway. I struck a trailer, the trailer of a truck that was crossing the road. I careened through the guardrail grazed a large pine tree, ran over a tractor that was parked in the ad adjacent field, and then I hit another tree. At that point, I lost control. <laughs> I've been there, and you may have felt that way. And in the midst of a world that maybe is just shaken to its core, what would this verse say to us? What would it say to a church the church in America and the church in Chunky and the churches in Mississippi. Well, I want to just tell you, bottom line, I think the Lord would say, hey, don't be shaken by all of this and don't let your faith, faith be waning, hang on. The bird that's sitting up there on the, y'all remember him? 
the bird that's sitting up here on that slick roof backwards uh, when he hit that vent pipe. There are three things that he did that I just want to give you to take home with you tonight. Three things that come out of this verse and from the heart of the Lord himself, I think. What did he tell us? Well, for one, uh, whenever you look at that bird up there and, and watch him, you know what he did? He relaxed. And I think the Lord would speak to you and your situation and me and my situation and say, relax. He said, where do you get that in the Bible? Well, I tell you, from Jesus. For it was Jesus who said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I'm here to tell you tonight that if we would begin to look, I'm not just talking about kick your shoes off and relax like that. I'm talking about in the Lord to relax in your life. And Jesus said, come unto me with all of the burdens that you may bear and all of the things that are going on and all the weariness that has come to your life. Just simply relax. And I want to tell you that there are so many of us who live by the motto when in trouble, when in doubt, run in circles, scream and shout. And we just go nuts about it and read all kind of stuff on Facebook and all that kind of idiocy. And the truth is that the Lord says you can come to me and you can relax. I'm amazed. I'm amazed at me. I'm amazed at you. I'm amazed at all of us how we let things come and just take our lives and ruin our relationship with everybody and every, even ourselves and with the Lord. Relax. I was preaching a revival over in the Alabama some years ago, and while I was there at the church that week, and uh, some of the folks said, you, you need to come up to our cemetery. And uh, they wanted to show me a, a, a tombstone up there. They said, you'll enjoy seeing that. And I said, uh, well, what, what, what do you, I, I didn't care about going to see it, but they insisted. And so one afternoon we went up there, and, and when we got up there, they showed me this man's, they showed me this man's grave marker that he had put up there himself. I mean, he had put what I was going to read on there. His name was J.A. Nordington. J.A. Nordington. I'll never forget him. And he had the date of his birth and the date of his death. And then down there at the bottom, this is what old J.A. Northington said to everybody who came by his tomb rock and stopped there and looked at it. He said, from the time you were born, that's what it said on the tomb, from the time you were born till you ride in a hearse, there's nothing so bad that it might not have been worse, so smile. And there must have been 10 people with me when I went up there at the cemetery, and they all wanted to see what I was going to do. So all, they weren't looking at the old J.A., he's dead. But, uh, but they, they were looking at me. And so when I read it, and it said, From the time you were born till you ride in a hearse, there's nothing so bad that it might not have been worse, so smile. And I'm telling you, what old J.A. Northington, well, by the way, J.A. Northington was 90 six years old when he died. 96 years old. I got the history on that old boy. And the fact is, in 96, he had never married. So he didn't know there was something worse than death. <laughs> now, if you're, la if you're laughing too big, you're laughing too big, I'm telling you. But from the time you're born till you ride in a hearse, there's nothing so bad that it might not have been worse, so smile. I think that the Lord himself would tell us, look, it's not the end of the world, and if it was, that'd be fine too. But I want you to know, you can relax in the Lord. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. When I say that, and I remember when I was pastor out in Texas. I was pastor in Fort Worth, Texas for five years, and... and uh, 
we had ranchers in our church. We lived out on the west side of, Tex uh, of uh, Fort Worth and a lot of ranchers in there in that area. And, and one of our old men, and he'd been there for e ages. And we were going through a drought in Texas. I'm talking about a show enough Texas big time drought. It had not rained, not for weeks, not for months. And the ground was cracking open like it just, I'm t I'd never seen anything like it. And so we were having this drought, and everybody was talking about the drought, and, they'd, I mean, th and there was no, there's no end in sight. We're just going to live in a desert, it looked like. And uh, after church one Sunday, we're standing outside the church, and this old-time rancher, I was standing out there talking to him. And, and I just asked him, I said, do, do you think it'll ever rain again? He looked at me kind of funny, and he said, always has, and he turned around and walked off. And that was the end of the conversation. It always has. And you know what it did? It rained. I'm telling you, not just right there. I mean, that's not like I can just bring it down, but I'm telling you, we got a rain, and the drought was over. But I want you to know that so many of us live on such a slippery slope of life that our faith is so shallow, so weak. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to me. That we sometimes don't relax in the Lord knowing that he knows what's going on in our lives. Look up there at my bird. For several seconds he sat there. He did not know what a vent pipe was. And he didn't really know what had stopped him. But here he is sliding down that, sliding down the roof, and he hit that vent pipe. And here he is with his back to me, and and uh, so now, what does he do? You know what he did? He did exactly what I'm telling you that we need to do. He began to relax. He began to realize, well, we're gonna get through this. I'm not, I'm not gonna die. I'm not gonna die right here. And so he relaxed. But that's not all. The second thing that bird did was this. He renewed. He renewed. And one of the things about this revival this week for every one of us, me, you, and all of us, there have been times in these moments that we've just, uh, we've just felt the Spirit of God and the presence of the Lord just renewing our spirit. I'm telling you to say, there is something ahead. There is something for me, and there is something for you, and there is something for this church. There is something for us as the people of God. And he, here's what that bird did. He's a great big old red hawk, and when he hit that vent pipe, he had his wings spread out there, and they were out there on top of the roof. And so whenever he realized he wasn't going to die right there, you know what he did? He pulled his big old wings in and he kind of turned around just a little bit and he you, you know he had that look on his face like I meant to do that you know how you do when you mess up like that but he turned around and looked and he would he would have turned he would have blushed but he he was a red hawk already so he didn't, he didn't you got it so here he is up there on top of that roof, and he pulled his big old wings in, kind of stuck his chest out, and kind of looked around to see if anybody was watching. And I was. But I want to tell you what he actually did. You could just actually see, in a matter of seconds, this old bird changed. This old bird was renewed. He didn't die there. There's something ahead for him. And he was renewed. Now what am I saying to you? I'm saying to me and I'm saying to you is that we need to be renewed by something that's more than anything that the government could give us and anything anybody else could do except the Lord himself. And you can know that. And I can know that. In the book of Romans chapter 12 after I preached through Romans 8 one time and then and then chapter 12 Paul says 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you would present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's the least you can do. I, I, therefore, my brethren, I'm going to ask you to present your bodies a living sacrifice unto the Lord. And this is what he said. And be renewed in your mind. What is he talking about? Just to think about the things of God, what is he telling us when he tells us that you and I need to be renewed in our mind? Well, of course, it means we need to start thinking differently. We need to start thinking about how he thinks about what's going on in the world, not how we think about what's going on in the world, and be renewed in our minds. Well, how can you be renewed in your mind in a time like this? Well, you need to know that we are the people who know. Ain't nobody else knows. Biden doesn't know. Trump doesn't know. Nobody else knows except the people of God. And what Paul was writing to us about is to say, you and I need to understand that we are the people who know. Know what? Well, we know, we know that God loves us regardless of what takes place in this world. That was a great place to say amen, and y'all sat there like a knot. I'm telling you, don't do it now. But we know that God loves us. Not one thing, not one little shift at all, not even, a, not even just the slightest bit has it changed at all that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And you and I are the people who know that God loves us. And not only does he love us, there is not one thing that can happen to you or me or anybody here who knows the Lord that can change that relationship. Zero. Not one thing can do anything to change that. That's why, that's why. Listen to this. I, I would have Gary stand up and do it, but he... But in Romans chapter 8, listen to this. When in Romans chapter 8, Paul begins to write that incredible part of Romans chapter 8, and he says, What can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No! For in all these things we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And we are the people who know. He said nobody else in the world except somebody who knows Jesus who knows the enormity of the love of God in his life, the enormity of the wonder of God's love in her life, except somebody who knows Jesus. And hang that on Romans chapter 8. There is nothing that can break that relationship. I don't care what goes on in my life or your life. Nothing can break that relationship. I don't know. I don't think that the bird could quote Romans chapter 8, but uh, that's what I felt when I saw him. And you could just see him as a new bird emerged. And so he relaxed and was renewed. And then the third thing, and all of this happened within a minute, minute and 15 seconds or something that old bird turned around he didn't know what he was hanging on back there but he started kind of twisting around there and he got himself turned around back like maybe he ought to have been and then you know what he did he kind of squatted like a bird would do and launched and he came out right directly 
exactly over me again. And I want to tell you, I, I didn't hear him say this, this sort of like, a, but, but, it, but when he started over me, he looked down at me like, let's see you do this. But it, he was flying over me, and you know what I heard him say to my heart? Hang on. Hang on. Because here's what he did. He resumed, he relaxed, renewed, and resumed being what God had made him to be. Now, I'm telling you, approximately a third of our churches, they say, say when we come back together and they actually start, you know, having this regular stuff again, about 20 to 30 percent of our people in our churches are not going to come back. Really. But there are going to be a lot of people who are going just like you faithfully been here this week. And I want to tell you that you and I, who whatever anybody else does, we need to resume being what God has made us to be. Quit worrying about everybody else on creation. You let God use you. I tell you, it doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are, how gifted you are, how void of giftedness you may be. Get in the game. Start being what God has made you to be. Spread your wings and fly. Now watch that bird as he flew higher and higher and higher. And the tree line that was right there behind that building, he didn't stop at the tree line. He flew up and over the trees higher and higher in the sky. That's what God made him to be. And you and I have something that God wants us to do. Don't tell me that God doesn't want to use you. Young people, moms and dads, grandparents, God wants to do something with your life. I am blessed and amazed and uh, <laughs> it's just amazing to think about this old lady that uh, here in Mississippi now, I'm not talking about somebody here at this church, but uh, there are not any old people here. But, uh, but this is an old lady in Mississippi, and she, they were having the statewide Olympic Games down at Biloxi, Mississippi. And this lady entered the dashes, the 40-yard dash, the 50-yard dash, the 75-yard dash, and the 100-yard dash. And this, I'm going to give you her name. Her name was Martha Hubbard. Not Mother Hubbard, but Martha Hubbard. Martha Hubbard was 94 years old. I'm telling you, 94 years old, and she entered four dashes she was going to run in in the Olympic Games, the Senior Olympic Games at Biloxi, Mississippi. And you know what? I'm just going to tell you, she entered the 40-yard dash, and she won. Gold medal, she won, 94 years old. She won her age category. 50-yard dash, she entered it, and she ran 50 yards. It took her a half a day, but she ran, she ran 50 yards, and she won it, and she got a gold medal for it. She entered the 75-yard dash and ran and she won the gold medal, 94 years old. And she, won, won, she ran in the 100-yard dash and won it and got a gold medal for the 100-yard dash, Martha Hubbard. And some of you may say, well, how, how many people were in those races against her? None. <laughs> None. She, went, went, she ran all four races and didn't have any competition, but she was running. That's better than a lot of folks come and just sit and don't get involved and won't let the Lord use them in their church and in their community. And, and, and God wants to use us. And I, I don't know why the Lord wants me to preach on this tonight, but I'm going to tell you 
that I want you to remember that bird, that red hawk, as I watched him completely go out of sight doing what God wanted him to do. What does he want you to do? I know that he wants you to get in the game. I know that there are decisions that God has placed on our hearts this week, and there are some of you who wanted to make decisions and you just haven't done it. But it may be tonight, maybe tonight, last night of the revival, that tonight God is speaking to your heart and you want to say, yes, Lord, you're going to hang in there. You're not going anywhere. You're going to serve him. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this week. Thank you for this night. Thank you for allowing us to be together and gather around your word. And, and Lord, I pray for someone who may be here discouraged and maybe their hearts have been uh, burdened down with all the things they're carrying, and I understand. But Lord, would you come to them tonight? Never so lovingly and ever so gently, would you just come and let them hear your voice say, Hang in there, my brother. Hang in there, my sister. Hang on. And Lord, I pray for this invitation time. I pray that, Lord, as your spirit moves among us in this service, that right here tonight decisions will be made. They will make a difference in a home, make a difference in a community, make a difference in this church. Lord, I pray that tonight... There will be many of us who will not leave here the same as when we came because you've been here with us and you've spoken to us and we say from the depths of our hearts, Lord, here's my life, use me. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing together one other song. Now I'm telling you, the Lord has been speaking this week and I know that because you've said that you've heard his voice. But I want you tonight to say if God has told you what you need to do, maybe make a decision here tonight, just do it. Don't miss out on this moment in time. We're going to sing 275. number 275. And as God speaks to your heart in this invitation time, do what he asked you to do. As we stand together and sing, would you come right now? <laughs>